So, we will start this, this first plenary. Uh, I'm Amanda David from, from IFD, uh, and I'm very lucky to, to be chairing this plenary. As you know, well, from the, the resignation of the UK Prime Minister to a national row over jets and, uh, and super profits in France, and to the si uh, silver lining uh, that last week's midterm budget speech in South Africa, tax policies all over the news across the world. Um, and it is true that uh, the urgency of responding to climate change and uh, the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic is actually uh, burdening, the, being burdened by the overlapping economic, energy and security crisis, which increases pressures on governments to mobilize resources and more importantly, to wisely spend them. The coordination of fiscal and monetary policies seems to be more important today than, than ever, um, with also uh, a looming crisis debt, which seems to be, which could have uh, far worse consequences than, than the previous ones. And then, moreover, when it comes to, to issues such as climate change, uh, where an appropriate response would be an international taxation over goods and services used by the rich, uh, we actually see the question arising on the, over the, the, the appropriate unit of decision making in terms of policy and maybe not the, um, the failure but the limited impact that international coordination has. So today we know much more on individuals' attitudes towards taxation, on the impact of, uh, of digitalization, on revenue collection, but how do these results actually help us shape um, the a tax response to the challenges that we face today in terms of energy poverty, inequality, climate change, inflation. So today's uh, first panel will aim to respond to some of these questions. Uh, it will highlight the major policy challenges, the research agenda that accompanies them and the priorities. And I have the pleasure to introduce very briefly uh, the panelists, of which we have Mauricio Cardenas, the former Minister of Finance and Energy in Colombia, who's also a professor of pro professional practice in global leadership at the Faculty of International and Public Affairs at the University of Columbia, and the Director of MPA in Global Leadership. Dr. Cardenas is a recognized expert on Latin America and an economist with a vast uh, academic and policy making experience. As the finance minister of Colombia between 2012 and 2018, he led a series of fiscal reforms that cut payroll taxes while triggering an unprecedented increase in formal jobs and discouraging the use of tax havens, criminalizing tax evasion for the first time. In addition to finance, he has also been a minister in four other portfolios in Colombia, economic development, transport, planning at the DNP, and mines and energy. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of California, Berkeley, and he's also a former president of the Board of Governors of the IMF and the World Bank, and of the Latin American and Caribbean Economic Society, uh, LATEA. Then online, uh, we have Michael Keane. Yes. Uh, who's a Ushoida Fellow at the Tokyo College University of Tokyo, also a research associate of CERDI, and of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and the Center for Business and Taxation in Oxford, and the formal deputy director of the Fiscal Affairs Department at the IMF. Over there, uh, for over 20 years, he played a central role in shaping and delivering IMF policies and advice on tax matters. And before joining the fund, he was a professor of economics at the universities first of Essex and then Queens in Canada and Kyoto. Um, his most recent book, Rebellions, Rascals, and Revenues, together with uh, Joel Samrod, aims to use history and humor to convey basic tax principles to a wider audience. We were, were also very lucky to have Chiara Bronchi, the practice manager at the Fiscal Policy and Sustainable World, uh, uh, Growth at the World Bank. She leads a team of micro-fiscal economists and tax experts who promote innovation, knowledge, and data, as well as analytics on fiscal policy, tax policy, and tax administration. Chiara has over 25 years of professional experience in economics and development, which has been gained in pre uh, prestigious international organizations, which include the ADB, IMF, OECD, and the UN. She holds a PhD in economics from the University of Bologna, 
and has published extensively on taxation and public spending. And most recently, she has scored a, uh, an approach paper for the Conclave of Ministers of Finance on financing human capital development. Then uh, we have Kunio Mikuya, Secretary General of the World Customs uh, Organization, who has also um, has been uh, the Secretary General since the 1st of January 20, uh, 2009. He provides leadership and executive management for the global uh, customs community priorities, which include developing the global customs instruments, standards and tools, securing and facilitating global trade, and delivering capacity building in support of customs reforms and modernization. And prior to joining WCO, he worked for Japan's Ministry of Finance for 25 years on a variety of senior posts um, in customs trade development. Um, he has a degree in law from the University of Tokyo in Japan and a PhD in international relations from the University of Kent. And finally, we have Nara Monkan, who's associate professor at the University of uh, Pretoria. She joined the Department of Economics on the 1st of August 20, uh, 2022. Um, and she's bringing with her more than 16 years worth of experience in public policy and um, public economics. Her affiliation with the University of Pretoria dates back to 2009, where she, when she was appointed the deputy director at the African Tax Institute and the director of ATI's Francophone program. And in her new role, she will be responsible for establishing a public policy hub for EMS and the University of Pretoria, um, in addition to her lecturing and research activities in public economics. Now, let's start. And uh, first of all, I would like to ask a question uh, to which each of you would have around five minutes to respond. And as I was mentioning, um, given the challenges that we face today, what do you think are the most relevant policy responses and how has recent research around tax policy, tax systems has shaped or not these responses? So we can start with Mauricio. Well, thank you very much, Anda. I'm delighted to be here. Um, thanks uh, to GDN for the invitation and delighted to be in this, uh, in this panel. Um, I first want to commend GDN for choosing the topic of tax policy. I mean, we can do many conferences about development and um, everything matters for development. You can draw a graph establishing a correlation between development and whatever you want, infrastructure, education, health, sanitation, um, and they'll give you the correlation you want to emphasize mm -hmm. and they'll give you an argument to make and they'll help you um, build basically the point that uh, whatever your area of choice uh, is, that's relevant for development. But really, we have to ask a deeper question, which is, at the end of the day, what really matters is state capacity. And within state capacity, fiscal capacity is essential. So unless we build fiscal capacities, uh, there'll be no development. And that brings us to the question of tax policy. Tax policy is absolutely essential. We live in a world where there are, there is actually a new generation of crises. And uh, these are not the crises of the past, like the global financial crisis uh, of 2008 and 2009, or the financial crisis in the emerging economies at the turn of the 20th century. These are different crises. And what we see in today's world is that first, we seem to live in a permanent state of emergency. And essentially, uh, this is the result of uh, a combination of crises that are uh, not just more frequent, but also more interdependent. Um, they are also happening at the same time, and they're truly global. And I'm not just alluding to the pandemic alone. The pandemic is a good example, but it's not the only one. Uh, we're seeing now a, a food crisis uh, and hunger crisis. We're seeing um, a cr energy crisis. That's, uh, that goes without saying. We're seeing also a climate crisis, more and more extreme weather events uh, with devastating consequences. We're also seeing uh, cyber warfare which is becoming more and more uh, frequent. So what are 
what are the common elements behind this uh, crisis? No single country can actually solve them. Um, and um, the, the crisis, this crisis by definition, they transcend borders. So here's the first point I want to make. The current institutional order, which is essentially what we inherited from the Bretton Woods institutions, the UN, were designed with a different purpose. We're designed with the purpose of helping countries, developing countries in particular, to build the capacity to provide national or domestic public goods. And that's fine. That's what we needed to do to build basically roads, to build schools, to build hospitals. But this crisis now, because of the interdependencies and their truly global nature, require global public goods. And global public goods are very different because you need to finance and you need to pay for global public goods with revenues, with taxes that are also global. Domestic taxpayers do not have the incentive to produce global public goods. So this is the problem of our generation. This is the problem that we have to tackle. How to solve this crisis provide the global public goods, and pay for that. So some people will argue, well, you can do that through aid, philanthropy. So philanthropy, if you had what the world provides in, say, ODA provided by governments or philanthropy by, provided by, by foundations, you get to figures that are in the hundreds um, of millions of dollars when it comes to philanthropy, in the few billions, maybe 10 billion when it comes to aid. And the problems associated with the global public goods are problems on the order of trillions of dollars to really provide solutions. So there is a gap there. So what are the basic concepts, uh, uh, and, and uh, you have to stop me when it's my five minutes, what are the basic concepts that should be behind the structure of a global tax system or the provision of global public goods. Well, you have to learn from the lessons from the domestic taxation, and, and I think we need not just uh, the ability to raise taxes, but we also need accountability, which is important, um, and, um, and we need incentives. We need basically uh, to, to have the right motivation so that people are willing to pay for these global public goods. And also, we have to introduce a concept, which is ability to pay. Not everyone can pay um, the same amount. So let's take examples. Let's take examples from the health uh, world and take, let's take an example from the, from the current climate crisis. So in the health world, we need to prepare better for the next pandemic. If a new pandemic were to, were to hit us, we, were, we will be as unprepared as we were uh, in early 2020. And preparedness means better technologies for monitoring, better equipment. Um, we also need um, uh, better capacity to provide uh, vaccines, and these are truly, uh, truly uh, global public goods. The World Bank has just launched an initiative, an FIF, a FIF, to, to basically to provide support for preparedness. And this is the result of a recommendation we made in a panel that was convened by the WHO to help the world design a better strategy to be prepared for the next pandemic. So the FIF, it's, it's an example of what's necessary, but still it's a small figure. And on the climate front, the emerging and developing countries that have made important pledges in terms of reducing emissions, when you make the numbers, the amount of investment you have to make to reduce emissions per GDP is much greater in emerging economies than in advanced economies. And this is puzzling. It's going to cost countries that emit less, it's going to cost more to reduce emissions because the size of GDP is lower, because the technologies to reduce emissions are pretty much 
this equally expensive everywhere. So who's going to pay for this? And this brings us to this conversation. I'm going to stop here now. This brings us to the conversation of how we're going to design the tax system to provide the global public goods that we need today. Excellent. Thank you so much. You mentioned the World Bank, so let's move to, to Chiara's answer to the question. Okay, thank you, Anda. Uh, I wish I had all the answers for uh, Mauritius, but uh, first of all, let me say thank you for inviting the World Bank and also me personally. It's uh, a great honor to be here. Uh, I've been knowing Serdi and actually I've been hiring uh, PhD graduate students to, to the bank, to the World Bank in my in different years. So, and it's the first time that I come in person. So I'm really delighted and also honored. And even more uh, about uh, talking about uh, tax policy. Um, as you know, I spent many years working on it, but now I have a team that is doing a lot of analytical work. And we are also supporting a lot of countries. And just to give you a sense of uh, where we see things, and um, the World Bank has been always supporting countries in strengthening their tax system, and then with the Addis uh, engagement in 2015, we have scaled up and strengthened our engagement. Right now, we are supporting 86 developing, between emerging and developing countries, and uh, we have a portfolio of lending, particularly to modernize the tax system and also ability to exercise domestic tax policies, um, of about um, $3.2 billion. So it's a, it's a big engagement for us. But I have to say that yes, this crisis, uh, the COVID-19, and then this multiplicity of compounded effects of the economic crisis, the war in, in Russia, sorry, the war in Ukraine uh, is um, proving extremely challenging because it's the first time ever that we see these compounded effects at once. And while countries in the, after, in the outbreak of COVID-19, advanced economies were able in part to weather the, the, the situation or to protect the most vulnerable by actually doing expansionary fiscal policy and quantitative easing, most of our, our emerging and developing countries did not have the fiscal space already two years ago, and now they're faced with even further challenges. And while there is a need to continue to support developing countries, we ask developing countries to maintain a fiscal sustainable path or a macro fiscal stable path, which implies actually to maintain a very a conservative fiscal policy. So as you can, so I'm just trying to say here that there is a very fine trade-off, especially for developing countries. So it's very hard to advise because the tendency is to try to tax, cut taxes because of with the, the, the perception that they will help at least fighting inflation. But at the same time, if they tax, they cut taxes, spending is is at risk and we have seen it we have done also a debt sorry we have done in the um, in the context of uh, a period of um, delay of payments of debt um, after the covid-19 crisis we were monitoring developing countries in particular low income countries on their spending and frankly all the spending was going to just wait, try to, to react to the health crisis and the economic crisis. So very, very little space. So obviously tax policy becomes increasingly important also for domestic reasons why we want to address the global challenges that Mauricio has highlighted. And so I have three points here that I want to say where we are focusing as a group, as a team, in terms of analysis where we think it's important to bring it back in tax policy and areas where it's more longer term because we realize that there is a political imperative to address the short term and also political sustainability, the stability of countries now. But at the moment, we are also at risk of, over, of forgetting that there are the long term development challenges that actually may pose even more uncertainty as we move forward. So tax policy, and I want also to rebound before I move on on, on Thomas' point that public expenditure and um, it's 
it needs to be also good quality to also have people willing to pay taxes. And this is very, very important. But I will talk on tax now. So one thing is we are focusing a lot on progressivity of taxation. And progressivity in terms of, yes, increasing more revenues, but in a fair way. And this is really vertical and horizontal efficiency we are looking at. And our uh, recent, uh, the World Bank recent poverty report, we issue it twice a year, as a beautiful analysis of how actually reintroducing or re-talking about progressivity of tax systems. I'm not talking about personal income tax alone, I'm talking about the progressivity of a system. So looking at base and looking also at the various tax instruments, and also instruments that have been perhaps not used so effectively, like, for example, taxation of property. Most of the Low-income countries do not tax property. I'm, I'm talking about real assets here and also net wealth. Um, but we are also looking at it from a, a soft perspective. So we have done an analysis now, it's been issued as a working paper, and we are want to invest more in this area on trust and progressivity and compliance. And we have found across 12 countries in different regions that the as the perception of progressivity of the tax system increases, there is more willingness to comply with the tax system. And this result is robust also backwards, meaning that if the perception is falling, also compliance is reducing. This is a very important because also the messaging and how message policy messages are presented gives a, 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 an impact, has an impact. I know, I, just two points I want to make. Climate change, so carbon taxation. We are investing a lot on taxation while we are also investing on adaptation of the World Bank. But we have now uh, two different results that are of extreme interest. One is on fiscal multipliers. So we have done a lot of analysis and we continue to do it now, applying it to countries on the impact of introducing carbon taxes but reducing the labor cost. So increasing labor productivity basically and introducing a tax that is very efficient. And the fiscal multipliers are quite impressive. And it's a so I'm just giving you some analysis because I want more people to work with us on these things. And, um, and finally, and, and I stop here because I want to be a little bit more provocative is what is the future of the tax system? We have very complex systems for developing and emerging economies in particular. They're very difficult to, to grasp and to implement in full. And I won't go tax by tax. But isn't it the moment to rethink perhaps tax policy and especially in a digital age? And that's another stream of work that we are pursuing. Thank you, Andam. Thank you so much. Um, so hybrid events are always a bit tricky. So let's move now to, to, to Michael. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much for having me. I'm sorry I'm not, uh, not able to join you, um, but I'm going to proceed on the assumption you can hear me and see me as much as you want to see me anyway. Um, yeah, so I think um, on the challenges side, I think we, we know that um, things are pretty difficult right now. It's um, three years ago, our only problem was to think about uh, raising a mere 15% of GDP in low-income countries to meet the, the SDGs. Since when we've been hit by a whole bunch of shocks, um, none of them very good news, as you've, uh, as previous speakers have, have said. So I won't labour the, the challenges too much, um, but let me try and introduce a note of optimism to say that I think there are some encouraging signs out there in the kind of DRM, um, or the resource mobil domestic resource mobilisation space. One I think is that um, it's been a difficult time. Of course, for many tax administrations and many administrations in developing countries, but a, a number of them, I think, have actually been pretty impressive in how they've responded to the, to the difficulties, including, I think, on the spending side. So I'm thinking of places like Togo that have been pretty effective in being rather innovative and using new digital methods to actually develop, develop, deliver um, income support. And I think that there's kind of an acceleration there that I think is, is encouraging. Um, a second encouraging area is a little bit prompted by, by Mauricio's remarks, which are very eloquent and, and convincing that many of the problems we now face are ultimately kind of coordination problems of, of various kinds. There, perhaps one, uh, the optimistic note there, I think, is the, um, the inclusive framework agreement 
or political political level agreement so far on international corporate tax reform. So I think maybe we'll have a chance to talk more about that. But I think um, we can have different views of that. But I think it is one of the few examples we have out there of what might be quite important, genuinely multilateral um, tax reforms. Um, the third area for optimism, and the one I'll focus my remarks on, if I may, is, is in the research side. So let me say a little bit about, uh, about, about um, research, where I think, you know, about 10 years ago, I wrote a paper, which was more or less at the start of the re revival of interest in tax and development, and I was kind of slightly skeptical as to whether this interest would continue, but it clearly has, at least till now. I think the last 10 years, we've really seen, I think, an explosion of very high quality research academic research on tax and development. So, you know, 10 years ago, I probably thought I knew the literature pretty well, but now I think it's, it's such a large literature, it really is quite hard to, to embrace it now. And that wasn't true 10, 15 years ago. And I think you just look at the agenda for this conference and you see how, how much the, the topic has advanced. Um, and I think that reflects a kind of a, I don't know what the opposite of a perfect storm is, but a kind of perfect anti-storm. Um, of three things. I think one is that donors have become more interested in research, and I think we heard some of that from Thomas in the, in the first session, where, you know, I think donors have come to realize that DRM is a long haul. Progress hasn't been remarkably rapid for the last 50, 60 years or so, when some of the international organizations have been involved. So I think there's a sense that, well, actually, we, we shouldn't be too ambitious in how quickly we can improve tax systems. You think about my own country, the UK, well, okay, the last few weeks haven't been a great example of tax systems in the UK, but until two or three weeks ago, um, the tax system we had then took like 200 years to develop. It wasn't something that happened overnight, and it involved several major European wars to, to get us there. So I think we've come to realize it's a kind of a long exercise. Second element, I think, has been that um, the kind of the access to an ability to use large data sets, uh, tax administration data sets, including with very active participation from tax administration authorities themselves. And the third one has been the kind of the rise of um, evaluation methods, essentially standards in evaluating uh, interventions have changed massively over that period. And I think that's had a very beneficial effect. So bringing all those things together, I think the research in this area, we've seen some great papers, I think in the last few years, it would be invidious to name examples, but I think I've learned a lot about how VAT chains work uh, where you exert pressure to make VAT chains work better. Some quite surprising results, I think, in that area. I think we've learned more about third-party information. Not that it's important, not its importance. I think every, you know, tax administrators have known that, again, for about 200 years. But in terms of, for example, how, just quantitatively, how important it can be. And some of these second best issues, when you improve information reporting on one dimension, you have a really big effect on um, reporting in areas where you're not so... Um, in much in control of information. So there have been some great papers, great advances. Um, that said, I think there's one aspect of where the link between research and policy stands now that maybe is worth reflecting on for the couple of minutes that I, I have left. And that's the question of whether there is a kind of a, a, a tension in a way between academic incentives in terms of research in this area and um, what matters for improving policy in the area, the kind of research that, that can actually make big changes in policy. Um, I think this is true in a number of areas, this tension is not unique to our area, and in many ways it's a good thing, but nonetheless I think it's worth um, thinking about that a bit. And when clearly the academic incentives these days, the incentive is to uh, essentially have a, um, a good data set, preferably a large data set, preferably a novel data set no one's ever used before, to address a kind of very well-defined problem and to do it in a way that uh, you can convince the econometricians that you're, you're really saying something about causality. So that's essentially what the academic incentives are when you want to get published in the, in the best journals, which of course is perfectly reasonable. And I think there are a number of issues that, that follow from that. One is there's a whole set of issues about external validity, which we can talk about maybe, maybe separately. But I guess the one I would highlight is, well, does, does this mean that we tend to focus on problems? Um, is there essentially a bias in the problems that get addressed by the best researchers in the area. That is, and I think, you know, stepping back, I think you could say that some of the early work in this area was very high quality methodologically, but actually didn't discover anything particularly new. Again, the importance of withholding was something that's been known for 250 years or so, um, things like that. Sometimes too, you can have a very nice paper with significant results, but when you look at the size of the effects, 
they're pretty small effects in terms of, the, of the, what we're looking for. Again, going back to, to Thomas's point about, you know, it's the, the revenue matters a good deal at the end of the day. I think the last few years have been some improvements on both of those fronts, but I think that's still a concern in some of the, some of the literature. But perhaps more fundamental point to raise, or a couple of more fundamental points to raise is one is, well, basically there are some key issues, including administration issues, that really we, we're going to really struggle to address by these methods that meet um, standards of, uh, uh, of um, you know, uh, confirming or claiming or asserting causality. You think of things that tax administrators spend a lot of time on, moving from uh, tax-based to function-based organizations, uh, semi-autonomous revenue agencies, it's very hard to have a kind of a field experiment or even a natural experiment that you can convincingly say much about. Of course, you can use matching methods and so on, but one can doubt whether they really capture some of the really nitty-gritty details that people worry about a lot when they design these institutions. Of course, there are many big policy issues that are even harder to address um, in, the, in these ways. In fact, some of them may simply be unconstitutional or illegal to address by deliberate experiments, so then you're left with kind of the, the sort of um, serendipity of finding particular natural reforms that can help answer your question. But they're all going to be very difficult for things like, well, what is if we change the standard rate in some country, what is the incidence of that? Um, we typically assume it's all passed on to consumers, but that's by no means obviously the case. So there's a whole bunch of these policy issues that are really big issues that are a little bit, I think, at the opposite end of a spectrum to some degree from some of the, some of the higher quality uh, research work. And so there's a kind of, it's almost like a missing middle um, between, on the one hand, the, the, the research that's great gets in, uh, in the, the top US journals, and the research that we find in things that, uh, you know, the, the international institutions produce, which are kind of more policy focused in some, focused on the big policy issues, but have a kind of less of an evidence base and rest on a lot of assertions. So I think one of the tasks for research in in the coming period is to try and um, uh, close that gap uh, a little bit. And that leads me, if I may, sorry, to just a final point, which is to put in a word, uh, very unfashionably these days, put in a word for theory. Uh, there are some issues where theory can actually help us, I think, quite a lot in thinking through policy. I would say, for example, some of the theory that's been, still being worked out on VAT thresholds has actually been quite important. Um, and there are other areas where really, we can learn something from the empirics, we can learn something from case studies, but we lack good theories to really guide us. And the, the, the kind of example of this always comes to my mind is how you design tax systems to it, treat micro enterprises, small enterprises, medium enterprises, large enterprises. Is that the right classification? Where should you draw the line? How do you deal with the kind of the, the inherent sort of kink points, jump points there? What are the best regimes within within those within those various segments? So all those things, I think, are actually amongst the, the hardest theoretical issues um, that we face in the area, and ones without which I think some of our policy is really scrabbling around because we don't have a coherent theory of how we should be going about those things. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I do just want to finish on that. I guess I've been somewhat critical in some sense, um, but I did want to end on the note of optimism. and. Uh, just encourage all the great young researchers out there to, to carry on, but never quite to lose sight of, um, of issues of magnitude, um, generalizability, and uh, so on. So thanks, I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'll now leave the floor to Cunha. D'abord, merci beaucoup pour m'inviter à cette conférence. Pour, je peux bien apporter un peu de la perspective de douanière, euh, comment on peut servir à, à, au développement durable. Euh, and then, euh, et aussi, euh, je apprécie parce que nous venons de commencer à travailler avec l'université de, de Clermont-Auvergne euh, en ce qui concerne DataFit, financé par AFD. Merci beaucoup. Well, um, now I'm uh, um, moving on to uh, English. Um, I would like to mention three points that uh, um, customs community is now um, considers very important. First one is about digital transformation. Uh, 
Uh, of course, um, uh, the pandemic has pushed us more to um, paperless trade, so it is necessary, and the trade is moving on to e-commerce, which is also a product of digital transformation. So data has become very important, and this is why I appreciate that uh, joint work. Uh, secondly, uh, it is uh, more security, fragility, and conflict. I want to um, well uh, mention more. Well, uh, you might remember that last year Afghanistan has collapsed, um, and uh, um, first uh, it was uh, the borders of Af Afghanistan who, which were uh, captured by uh, Taliban, now the current uh, government. And uh, it, it, well, in later perspective, it is a, it was a very wise uh, strategy to um, capture the borders so that they can't get uh, customs um, revenue which is the major part of Afghanistan. And uh, um, uh, so uh, before military collapse, uh, um, fiscally, uh, that country was unable to, to sustain. And when I look into other countries, uh, I see similar problems, uh, especially in West Africa, for example, in the Sahel region. Quite often, insurgents uh, attack borders, especially targeting at the customs. They know that by doing that, they can well, um, uh, choke the, the central government in terms of revenue collection, but also trade. So this is a big uh, issue. And we have done research uh, on Middle East and North Africa and, uh, and West Africa and Central Africa and uh, issued a research uh, report where we said that, uh, well, whenever there is a conflict uh, at borders, specific point, just closing the borders, which is quite often the military security force um, uh, solution, which is not a good one, because anyway, informal trade continues. And uh, um, uh, as it is closed, uh, uh, traders would uh, go into more illicit trade, risky trade, such as narcotics, firearms. So in a global sense, that doesn't help your country. And uh, also that creates competition between armed forces and, uh, and the states. And uh, um, quite often armed forces are very efficient and fair in collecting revenue. Uh, it's ironical, but uh, uh, that might create more grievance in the borderlands, which would destabilize the country and the legitimacy of that state and tax system in general. So that's a huge problem. And uh, um, when I brought this at the June annual council session, um, our members said that it is not only limited to Africa or Middle East. Look at, for example, Africa, uh, Americas. Uh, there are so many violent borders and uh, in Asia as well. So it's a common uh, problem and how uh, we can uh, solve this issue. Uh, we'll continue to research, uh, continue the research, but uh, um, this is um, another of big question for us. Uh, the third uh, um, big uh, element is environmental issue. And uh, quite often we hear about uh, we should move towards a circular economy, which is fine. But circular economy doesn't conclude in one country, but trade is inevitable part of circular economy. But how we can trace uh, the, those goods, whether they are a circular economy or not? And uh, um, for example, uh, we... Uh, use uh, classification harmonized system, but are they, they are not uh, necessarily constructed in that way. It, it is more fiscal. And uh, well, socially, uh, socially uh, how we can, uh, well, uh, change that uh, HS system is one way. And another big problem is valuation. Um, well, um, how you value waste, how you value recycled goods, it is not certain. So the current WTO agreement on custom valuation doesn't necessarily address that issue because it is not only transaction value, but uh, it's social value that we have to think about. So this is a big question and uh, um, we try to um, uh, reduce carbon footprint of trade and custom system. But in doing so, we need to um, trace data, but the, 
basis of data, how to um, identify, is not uh, um, still available. So this is a big question to all of the researchers in front of me. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time. Nara? Yes, thank you very much, Anda. And, um, and uh, first, I'd like to thank um, the, the, the people, the, sorry, the, the local government revenue initiative um, at the University of Toronto for inviting me here today, of course, and also the, the organizer of GDN. So, and uh, I'll basically answer the, the questions by bringing basically the policy responses um, uh, to those challenges from the African perspective, if you'll allow me. So first, um, uh, in, it has been, um, uh, in order to tackle, we mentioned the issues of uh, tax avoidance and tax evasions and illicit financial flows out of Africa. And, um, and, and of course, there's been the, the, the effort to, to basically change international uh, tax rules in order to do so. Um, uh, for example, the, the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Tax um, uh, argued that um, I mean, the, 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 the inefficiency of the international financial system shows that um, as basically enable 10% um, of the global GDP to be hidden away uh, in tax havens uh, with the wealthiest 1% uh, um, uh, able to basically evade up to 25% of the income uh, using offshore structures. And of course, African countries are heavily um, uh, impacted by that. Uh, and of course, we, we know that there's been the two pillar solutions um, uh, um, organized um, uh, by the, the inclusive framework. But although some African countries of that my own, uh, there still remained a lot of concern, at least for African countries, um, one being, for example, the, um, the global minimum tax and another, the, 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 the percentage, the 35 percent um, uh, of the residual profit. So th that's, that's basically one um, aspect to it. And uh, for example, they, they, uh, at the African level, at the, uh, the, the African minister's level, um, they've called for a proposal for United Nations uh, Convention of Tax. So maybe um, uh, we need to seriously consider that um, as, at, at least at the minimum um, to, to continue um, 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 discussing about you know, increasing international tax cooperation and, and, and solving those issues. Another policy response um, has been the, the, the creation of the, I mean, the launch of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in, in January 2021. 20, uh, uh, um, um, basically, if we are able to, to, to implement it if efficiently, it could basically um, de deliver a lot of profits in terms of um, jobs, growth, um, and poverty reduction um, on, on the continent level. So up to date, right now, we had 42 out of the 55 countries that have ratified the, the, government, the, the agreement, and at least 80%, 88% of the negotiations um, have been uh, uh, finalized on the product-specific uh, product rules of origin. So um, if we, uh, that in order to uh, uh, basically accelerate the implementation of the, the AFTCA, um, taxation can be a, a good tool there um, to actually um, uh, um, uh, uh, caution the, the revenue losses and, uh, and the distortion from trade, um, but also um, deepen, uh, uh, help in, in deepening the, the, the integration of uh, by harmonizing tax um, and fiscal policy at the custom level. Um, but of course, on the, at least on, the, con on co the continent level, the tax policy should really focus on sectors um, such as manufacturing, agriculture, um, services and pharmaceutical and renewable energies, of course, and, and research and development, which are really key for, for international trade uh, at the continental level. For example, Kenya, at, the, uh, um, at, at, at least at its level, in order to fast track the implementation of the AFCA, AFTTA, had decided to basically to align the strategy with um, national development strategies. Another response has been, of course, the use of, um, I mean, leveraging digital technology to improve tax collection and administration, um, administrative efficiency at the continental level, which we know has been exacerbated um, uh, through COVID. Um, right now, for example, we know that if we are able to really invest more and accelerate, actually, the investment on, in digitalization to enhance domestic resource mobilization, um, the, the benefits are tremendous. Um, for example, involving rapid technologies such as big data, we're talking about the importance of data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning um, can actually provide um, uh, 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 strong enablers to increase um, taxpayer satisfaction um, and also modernize the services for, for, for better domestic resource mobilizations. And again, we have examples already 
of that being done at the continental level. And all, of course, we also see uh, policy efforts um, to achieve food sovereignty and to adapt Africa's food systems um, to climate change and in, uh, um, uh, since especially, again, um, not only with um, uh, um, the climate change issues, but also the Russia war, the Russia war in, in Ukraine. So um, right now, for example, in West Africa alone, more than 27 million of people needed immediate food assistance um, in 2021 last year due to issues like drought, poverty, high food import prices, environmental degradation, displacement, poor, uh, poor trade integration, and conflict. Um, so, um, it's, it's, and we, we, it's also been said that if the global temperature continue to rise in the trend of, like say, three um, degrees Celsius, um, uh, the, disruption, the disruption to current food systems on the continent will be profound for millions of people. So um, the government, should, government in Africa actually should continue to actually use tax policies to promote a transition towards a more um, renewable, uh, I mean, resistance, um, uh, climate uh, uh, resistance uh, type of um, agriculture. Um, and of course, we need to continue uh, implementing um, the implementation of carbon tax. Uh, the previous um, panelists were mentioned that earlier to actually also um, um, uh, improve, um, achieve uh, food efficiency uh, and security in, on the continent. Also, we've, been, we've seen um, uh, some uh, responses, of African responses to actually, or lack of responses to actually tackle the growing uh, inequality crisis. Uh, for example, the 2022 commitment to reduce, um, reducing inequality um, index has shown that um, during the period, um, the, the pandemic period, um, most government have actually failed um, to mitigate the rise in inequality um, stemming from the pandemic and um, with many countries not only cutting um, health and social protection expenditures but also um, increasing, failing to actually increase um, uh, taxation on the richest people and sometimes um, cutting um, taxes um, uh, on the rich. So again, we need to uh, uh, continue um, uh, uh, investing heavily in, in policies curbing inequalities um, uh, through the tax systems, and but also through uh, public expenditure by focusing a bit more on progressive taxation. And then lastly, um, uh, um, efforts need to continue um, uh, in terms of policy responses to actually tackle the, the African rising debt and the emergence of a new type of uh, debtors on the continents. So that's why I'll stop here to Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Kara, if we go back to you, uh, you guys have launched a report on averting uh, fiscal crisis in a deterring global environment. Can you maybe tell us a bit more in like three minutes so yes. that we can take questions about the, the findings and the implications for low and middle income countries? Thank you, Handa. This, was, uh, this report is fiscal implications for deteriorating global economic environments in emerging economies and developing economies. And it was triggered actually for a need to assess the vulnerability of uh, countries to be able to, mo uh, to monitor vulnerability. And in particular, in the outbreak of a, a spike in food prices as well as energy prices. And uh, as we saw, a lot of countries immediately tried to reduce taxes uh, or to give subsidies. So I want to give you two points of this. Um, the, the report is rich and also the toolkit that is looking at vulnerability is, is even richer and we're looking at it from a macro fiscal perspective as well as also micro dimensions. But I think two things have emerged. One is a few figures that I want to give you just to give you a sense that um, in terms of energy subsidies right now the World Bank estimates that in low and middle income countries only the, the richest 20% of the population is really benefiting from the uh, energy, uh, sorry, from the cut or the reduction in, in excises or taxes on the energy. And fuel and agricultural subsidies alone are estimated to count for $1.2 trillion globally. So I think that is the way that we should at least uh, focus on in the short term, um, this is a lot of resources that could be repurposed to address the problems of vulnerabilities that certainly from the bank perspective is protecting the poor or uh, uh, frankly at this point is preventing uh, uh, 
in the increase of poverty as we are witnessing right now, and um, and also to address uh, to to be able to address it in a more effective way. At the end of the day, we find that uh, transfers, uh, direct transfers, especially where countries in those countries where the mechanisms are functioning, but we have been helping to build almost in, in every country now. Uh, proper targeting can in fact lead to um, a more efficient way of allocating resources, not only efficient and also giving more space for also investing in longer term investments and also energy transitions and uh, the issues that I raised earlier. So this, I think, is, is one of the priorities, considering the amount of resources that are being involved. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Marisa, we did mention the issue of carbon taxes, but how can carbon taxes, but also other types of taxes, like sin taxes, uh, bad taxes on bads, could be leveraged to tackle the overlapping uh, challenges that we were seeing? Well, sure. Um, so when thinking about the redesign of tax systems, I think one, one good advice and one good way to start is to think in terms of bads. I mean, taxing bads is always easier than taxing goods. So, um, and we typically underestimate the importance of taxes on, on bads. So I would say that one category of this is taxes for health, taxes that improve health outcomes. 41% um, of the deaths in the world are associated with non-communicable diseases, diseases that can be avoided. So taxing, for example, tobacco, sugary drinks, um, taxing uh, ultra-processed foods or alcohol that is harmful for, uh, for health. All those things are important. Um, there is a task force, uh, it's called the, um, the Bloomberg, Larry Summers, uh, Michael Bloomberg, Larry Summers uh, Task Force on Taxes for Health. That, ref that task force estimates that if you increase by 50% these taxes, um, you can reduce deaths associated with non-communicable diseases by 50% also. So this is important. Carbon taxation is another good example. So carbon taxation is, is very hard, it's very difficult. We've seen people in the streets basically protesting against uh, this type of taxation. But it's possible. And here I want to suggest that we typically as economists or practitioners, finance ministers are very adamant against the concept of earmarking, but sometimes earmarking can be necessary. And I think carbon taxes are a good example. Maybe you need to earmark carbon taxes for whatever purposes each country, uh, its jurisdiction has. But one good way of doing this is, say, provide cash transfers to the poor. Um, and that basically helps you solve this issue that when you subsidize energy, typically the benefits go to the top um, income earners of the population. So the idea of earmarking perhaps needs some revisiting um, when we um, discuss these issues associated with uh, uh, taxation on, on bats. Now, one final word. Tax systems not only need to be revamped and you need to raise more revenues, that's the ultimate goal, but you need to do also some restructuring, not necessarily the taxes of the past are useful or helpful today. They may be doing, you know, they, they may be damaging consequences of the old tax structures. And let me give you an example from Latin America. In the 1950s, it was very common to introduce taxation on payrolls because payrolls were basically easy to tax. They were visible, more visible uh, than uh, profits. So payroll taxes were more important than corporate income taxes. But payroll taxes we now know generate very negative side effects like informality. So restructuring the tax system so by reducing payroll taxation or taxation on, on labor and increasing taxation on, on profits or including uh, wealth taxation, uh, I think it's a better idea. In Colombia, we did that with an amazing effect in terms of reducing informality by basically cutting payroll taxes and raising corporate income taxation. So restructuring tax systems.
is something that deserves uh, some thinking as well. Great, thank you so much. Michael, um, Maurice had mentioned corporate tax, uh, taxes and we actually see that there are potentially massive changes in the international corporate tax system. So what would be your take on the impact that these changes could have on the developing countries and how could they react? Yes, thank you. No, so there, I think there are big changes um, probably coming. Um, maybe just a couple of disclaimers before I, before I go into the kind of um, issues requiring some response. Um, so I think one is that um, there's been a lot of attention on international tax issues for the last decade, um, possibly too much attention, um, because I think um, it's not the answer to the DRM problems we're concerned with is not going to be, I don't believe, through the, through the corporate tax. Um, one could argue that attention has been taken away from some other possibly more important tax instruments. Um, nonetheless, it's a, it's a big change, an important change. Um, second is, I don't, I'm, not, um, I'm not here to say these reforms are perfect. Um, I think we can all have views about them. We probably all want them to be somewhat different. But I think they are really very um, fundamental. And fundamental because they've really, they're very complicated now, a um, lot of issues, but they've really thrown up in the air the, the norms that the international tax architecture has relied on for 100 years. And so once you've removed these norms, I do think you are opening up for um, maybe some more interesting possibilities than, than what's actually in, in prospect. And I should say too, I think, um, you know, after you think about taxing bads, you think about taxing rents. That is, you think about taxing uh, returns in excess of normal because that is our non-distorting tax probably usually has some attractive um, uh, um, in, um, equity properties too. So I think this issue also ties in with taxing rents. I think taxing rents as an objective has also not been given sufficient uh, attention. But coming back to the minimum tax itself, maybe just to say a bit about what it is. So what it is not, it is not a rule that says the corporate tax rate has to be at least 15%. It basically says you look at, for the large, largest multinationals, you look at every subsidiary uh, in your country and you figure out if on aggregate they're paying 15% uh, or not on their financial profits. If they're paying less than 15%, then there's going to be a top-up tax applied. It's applied to a slightly complicated base. I won't, don't think I need to get into that, but there is what's called a carve-out. But basically there's this top-up tax. One other, so what, what does all this mean for, for, for lower income countries? One is you can't really say, you can't really opt out. <laughs> you, it's really very difficult to say, I don't want anything to do with this because it's in, implementation really relies on the large capital exporters deciding to impose the minimum, the minimum tax. Uh, so even if you don't impose it, this top up tax is probably gonna be imposed um, by, uh, by another country. So what are the policy responses? Well, <clears throat> leading off what I just said, the, the first question is who's going to get the money? Who gets the money from these top-up taxes? And that's been a very contentious issue throughout the debate. Uh, really quite late in the process, there is a provision introduced that does allow source countries to do the topping up themselves. It's called the, <clears throat> the Qualified Domestic Minimum Top-up Tax. But there's a very straightforward, I think, recommendation for many low-income countries is you should have you should have one of these qualified minimum domestic top-up taxes. Otherwise, you're going to leave money on the table for some other country to, to collect. Um, <clears throat> there's a second set of issues around tax incentives, because um, a lot of tax incentives, in, these rules have no provision, they have no grandfathering, have no special exemptions for particular types of incentives, well, more or less. But basically, for example, tax holidays, uh, if they are given to, a, to a, an entity that's in scope, will largely become ineffective because there'll be a top-up tax imposed elsewhere. They don't become wholly ineffective because of this carve-out I mentioned. So basically, tax holidays become much less effective, reduced rates become much less effective. And so it really requires a rethinking of, 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 of incentive regimes in, in many countries. And I think many, of, many tax people would say, well, that's great. That's, uh, that's a good aspect of the minimum tax. Um, however, we can see, we, it's not hard to believe that there are going to be pressures for countries to introduce incentives in other ways. So we might get incentives on the spending side, which may, uh, may be good or maybe even more damaging. So it's a little bit of a case of um, being careful what you wish for. Um, 
Having said that, it's worth bearing in mind this only applies to uh, entities within the largest multinationals, so over 750 million euro turnover. So my advice is to, for all countries, is to look at what entities in your country would be affected and think how you're going to respond, which is probably through a QDMTT. You have to think about, well, do I have fiscal stability agreements out there? Am I going to have investment agreement problems? A whole bunch of issues to, to think through. And I guess the final issue to think through is, well, what do I do with my regular corporate tax rate? Um, some people think this 15% effective rate will become kind of a flaw that everybody's going to focus on getting their rate down, their effective rate down to 15%. <clears throat> on the other hand, a lot of the past evidence suggests that countries react to higher tax rates abroad by raising their tax rates. So if, even if you're, you know, if you're a developing or any country, maybe you have nobody in your, in no entity in your country faces a rate below 15%. Well, you might think, so I'm not going to be affected. That's not right because countries, of entities in your country now have less opportunity to shift profits abroad. So now maybe you can raise your rate a little bit. And that historically is what countries have tended to do. But of course, we've never had a global minimum before. And I think, again, going back to my earlier theme, I think that's an area where, um, you know, doing, a, doing an experiment and the introduction of a global minimum tax may be it's challenging, maybe not impossible. But I think that's an area where, for example, we do need, a, do need a lot more theory to understand what might happen in these circumstances we've never, never seen before. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's where I would um, finish on the minimum tax again. You know, I, just to say, I think in a world where we don't see many times of multilateral signs of effective multilateralism, I think this is one where we can say that there is some progress. And really, just to say that actually, you know, the, the uh, I was involved in some work that UNCTAD did on this, and you know, this is a revenue winner for for low income countries. The people who lose are the investment hubs, <clears throat> so it's a revenue winner. Uh, I think about 15% of the payments by these enterprises was the UNCTAD estimate. So it's a revenue winner, but of course, then there are going to be impacts on investment to think about. But I won't talk about those. I'll, I'll leave that there. I think it is it is something that countries have to deal with. And I think we have some clear guidelines on, on how to do it, but there's not much time also. This is all supposed to happen really by the start of 2024. So um, this should be up on the agenda. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Um, Nara, in this international context, how could, for instance, African countries better leverage their taxation systems in order to respond both to the COVID recovery but also the, the, the international context as a whole? Um, thank you very much, uh, Andra. So, I mean, you have mentioned um, all those, um, uh, the policy resistances that uh, um, the panelists and I mentioned earlier. But I think um, in, in, in addition, we can also, um, uh, for example, in the, the I mean, the, the, the informal sector remains a, a big issue uh, on, on the continent. Um, for example, the International Labour Organization estimated that approximately 85% of Africa's labour um, is still within the, the, the informal economy. Um, and then the World Bank in 2020 reported that um, more than 80% of workers um, in sub-Saharan Africa actually find a livelihood in the informal economy. So I think we need to, the African countries con need to continue efforts towards um, improving the efficient um, uh, fiscal management of the informal sector. And one thing uh, we'll, 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 um, they should, I mean, more, more and more, they, we, we should start teasing out, um, I mean, distinguishing between the actual taxpayers that, are, that fall naturally um, in, the, in the informal sector based on realistic segmentation. Um, but also um, uh, identify those opportunistic actors that are basically hiding um, in the informal sector. And then we actually see that through those opportunities, actors, billions of dollars are actually um, uh, going through the informal sector there. So more effort needs to be uh, put into there. And there's a big, big role for, for digitalization to actually um, uh, start tackling that. For example, um, um, in countries like um, South Africa, they've uh, 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 promoted, for example, a regulation on interception, what they call regulation on interception of communication, provision of communication, um, RICA to actually track how the funds and transaction of, of indi individual operating in the informal sector can actually be e extrapolated um, uh, so that we can identify uh, the income for tax purposes. and. Um, similar initiatives are actually being implemented in, in other countries such as Nigeria and in Nigeria and in, in Kenya. So we all talked about, again, the importance of uh, reducing inequality, again, exacerbated um, in the aftermath of uh, the COVID-19 
So we talked about the issue, we, um, Michael mentioned the issue of taxing rent, we talked about the progressive taxation, um, uh, a tax on wealth, um, uh, uh, which includes property tax, um, uh, um, tax on financial, um, uh, on land and on financial wealth, like um, uh, capital gain and, and inheritance tax. Um, and we, for example, we take the, the, the case of Uganda who um, successfully in implemented the, the high net worth individual unit in 2015, which basically targets specifically um, um, uh, efforts in mobilizing tax revenue from the high net worth individuals um, uh, uh, through the countries, which has literally in a year uh, brought almost 5 million of additional revenue. And this kind of initiative can be uh, uh, continue, um, can be actually uh, uh, Im improved. And also, just lastly, I wanted to just say that um, more and more we need to have that mindset shift of, of um, not um, uh, continue looking at Africa through that archaic uh, lens that is a poor, war-torn place depending on outsiders in need of saving um, from the West and the base for um, other shit. We need to start saying, yes, there are challenges, but we need to um, have um, a change of uh, thinking that this is also a land of opportunities and obviously, and, and we've seen countries like, you know, China, uh, I, will, I will stop there, and Russia and other countries that have seen that opportunity and taken advantage of that. Um, and um, and, and the, um, I think Mauricio would say earlier that um, we, we can't solve, one country cannot solve um, the issue, let alone um, ignore basically Africa in, 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 in the, the bigger decision making. So we need to really have that increase of uh, representation in global multilateral fora, uh, whether it's at the UN, whether it's at the UN Security Council, um, and, and, and for example at the D20, right? So why not again um, looking at those international fora using, I mean, the, the, the sovereignty of, I mean, the, the leeway of, of certain countries to actually push um, Africa representation so that Africa can be at the table of decision making and be part of the global solution. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. And before uh, going to the, the questions from the audience, can you um, now also mention the, the African Trade Union? And that we're actually wondering what is now the research agenda regarding customs? Thank you. Um, well, um, um, perhaps we can um, rephrase the question that uh, how customs can mobilize, uh, um, leverage the technology uh, to, um, pers to realize their function, uh, function of fair taxation, uh, trade facilitation, and preserving security at borders. Because now that nowadays, uh, digital technology produces so much data and uh, um, well, real-time data. So uh, what we need is accurate data in a timely manner because customs function is different from tax that it is not retrospective, but rather real-time is what we are doing. Therefore, uh, we would like to, um, well, you, uh, so with that in mind, we uh, set up a data strategy uh, this year that uh, firstly, how to share data because custom data is, um, well, directly uh, linked to commercial uh, interest. So customs are very timid or conservative in sharing data. How to make them more confident in sharing data with uh, data, um, well, privacy preserving technology and, uh, um, well, starting from more statistic one. Because uh, in that area, we are lagging behind. And uh, um, uh, also, uh, we want to push our members towards more open data policy because uh, um, customs has a wealth of data because all cross-border data, whether it is goods, people, or cash, it should be uh, reported to, to customs. So how about making that data more openly available to well, um, researchers, but uh, also for other governments and uh, um, business uh, for giving them uh, good, uh, um, well, uh, uh, data. And then, uh, secondly, uh, we want to establish community of practitioners and we'd like to invite uh, our researchers to come because our objective is that the customs and the service provider, but also academia, to produce a proof of concept um, paper. And so that uh, um, using data, or using technology is very important. And thirdly, it is capacity building. And in that sense, what we need is to produce a narrative uh, for uh, 
for the management of customs that how important to use data and uh, um, to change their mindset, uh, uh, embracing more data culture and creating uh, um, de customs data ecosystem is what uh, we are moving for. So uh, this is why uh, tax is well advanced, whereas customs, because of that, uh, um, well, security concern or um, privacy concern, we are lagging behind. This is what we want to achieve. And, uh, um, but uh, I want to make sure that we, want to, we don't want to create a surveillance state, but uh, a rather more open data, but uh, for the sake of really um, uh, protecting uh, society from illicit trade, uh, many, well, firearms, narcotics, at the same time, um, well, uh, fair uh, taxation is what we want to achieve. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Maybe we can take a couple of, of questions from the audience. If there are, and if online there are questions. Um, so, are there questions? Yes, so I see one there, one there, or a couple of will help. Let's try me to take three or four, and then, we'll, so, please go ahead. And please introduce yourselves. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. It was a very interesting panel. I'm Abdul Mohit Chaudhary. I'm with the South Center, which is an intergovernmental organization of developing countries in Geneva. And I had the South Center Tax Initiative, which is our flagship project on uh, supporting developing countries and in international tax cooperation. I just wanted to uh, make uh, two comments. One is a sort of a cautionary note on carbon taxation, because historically developing countries have contributed less to emissions and even now are contributing less to emissions, whereas these carbon taxes would be paid by developing countries. So it would, in a way, add an additional tax burden on developing countries. So uh, this prescription as a solution for something which they have not really contributed uh, requires something to be taken carefully. Uh, the uh, second point I would like to raise is on the point regarding the need to not focus so much on corporate tax, which was made by one of the speakers, uh, the reality is that companies like Fed, FedEx, Nike, Whirlpool paid 0% in effective corporate tax rate in the US in 2020. Amazon has a 5% effective tax rate in 2020. These are really uh, enormous corporations. And the inability to tax them effectively has serious competition concerns, not just within developed countries, but across developing countries as well. So thank you for that. Thank you. I think we have two other questions there. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, Thi Chofong uh, from the Ministry of Trade, uh, Cameroon. Uh, uh, my main uh, question uh, goes to Professor Monka. Uh, in one of her recommendations, uh, she talked of uh, imposing more taxes on the rich and lesser taxes on the poor as one of uh, the fiscal policies in reducing income inequality. Uh, my worry goes thus. Uh, is it not another form of inequality that will come in the future? Thank you. Thank you. We'll have a, a panel on inequality this afternoon, I think. It's might be interesting to pick up on that question. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Austin Iraoya from the Center for the Study of the Economies of Africa. We are based in Abuja, Nigeria. I, I want to very much appreciate uh, Professor Mauricio for uh, one of the things you said is the fact that it is easier to always tax bad than taxing goods. And I wish to also add that uh, fiscal revenue from taxing bad is also easier to mark than a marking tax from goods. Take for instance, when we uh, generate fiscal revenue from taxing tobacco, for instance, uh, the WHO recommends that um, a percentage of that tax should be a mark for financing the health sector. And uh, from our research, we discover that this, this is one avenue that uh, particularly African governments are yet to wake up to. And we have a growing number of uh, people smoking and people picking up smoking, for instance, 
on a daily basis. And that happens to be one very huge potential sector through which the African government can generate fiscal revenue for, for the sustainable development goals. Now, my question is, we have so much of research emphasis on taxing goods. For instance, if you look at our agenda and uh, for this conference, most of the research efforts are on taxing goods. Uh, but when I read the call for proposal and the uh, conference concept note, for instance, I knew there was a clause on tobacco taxation. But looking at all our discourse for this section, I look forward to really seeing if we're going to have a presentation in that line. So my question now is, how do we begin to raise more effort on research on taxing on taxing bads? That is one. Uh, secondly, my quick one, we also go to Professor Nara, which is on AFCFTA. We look at the AFCFT, a very great policy response for the African government, and it's expected to generate a huge fiscal revenue for African development and for sustainable growth. My question now is, if you look at the provisions of the AFCFT, there is very little mention on bow trade, for instance, or sustainable trade. And so what is your take on AFCFT and the potential AFCFT could have on promoting sustainable trade in Africa and also ensuring that um, it does not just, just worsen the problems for the African government. Thank you. Thank you. I know we had another question there. So maybe we can take that one and have a round of replies. And then we can take a couple of other Hi, questions. thank you. So I'm Tiga Winebris with Rago from Burkina Faso. And I'm a current master student in development economics in this university. So I got two questions. And my first question is addressed to to Mrs. Uh, Chara Bronchi, representing the World Bank. So what could be a relevant way to, to create more incentive uh, on carbon taxes? Like, and uh, as you all mentioned, we know that our oil is currently in a deep stage of multiform crisis, such as uh, rising living costs, food insecurity, and yet uh, a rising crisis of inequality. So. How should global financial institutions can redesign and rethink the redistribution of uh, the tax payment in order to create more balance in global social inequality? Thanks. Thank you so much. So let's take a, a round of answers. Maybe we can start with, with Michael because he's online and he will not have coffee with us. So at least he can get priority on, on the replies. Oh, OK. Thank you very much. Um, well, they were all great questions. Maybe I can pick and choose a bit um, on some of the answers. So on the carbon taxes, I think the point is well taken about kind of historical responsibility and the fairness to mention there. Maybe just to mention that, um, of course, you know, burning fossil fuels also causes local pollution. And I think in many, um, many parts of the world, including developing countries, even that part is under is under charge for. So I think there is a little bit of a way to go. <clears throat> um, in terms of pricing fossil, fossil fuels, purely in terms of local air quality issues. Of course, that's not a... <clears throat> and there are other related issues where areas where carbon taxes may be a good second best response, like congestion and so on. So I think there are some local benefits from carbon taxation too. So I'm not trying to detract from that uh, issue of, uh, of responsibility, but, but I think, you know, it, that there are, there are um, national motives for introducing some form of carbon taxation. And maybe then just to leap ahead to another... Uh, of the questions that um, actually is aimed at Chiara, but maybe I can just mention in terms of carbon taxation. Um, of course, there we, I think we have to think about border carbon adjustment, um, which is kind of beginning in, in Europe. And I think at some point, I know I hope to talk about it in one of the one of the parallel sessions, uh, has implications for developing countries. Um, going back to the first question, need to. I didn't say we shouldn't focus on corporate tax. Um, I was saying a couple of things, I think. One, actually, we should focus on corporate tax, but we should focus on making it more effective as a tax on rents. Um, and many corporate tax we have are very distorting. And, you know, I think one cost of the debate on the international, um, around the inclusive framework has been we haven't really focused on the role of the corporate tax. We haven't focused on the idea that this should be a rent tax. And that's something that, um, in fact, maybe some of the developments make it harder to turn uh, corporate tax into a rent tax. Having said that, it's certainly true that there are companies that have paid uh, very little tax. It's going to be harder for them now if the minimum tax comes along. But also, you know, when we, when we scale these things, we did some work at the fund a few years back, and I think we came with one of the bigger numbers in terms of profit shifting 
the profit shifting cost um, was higher to low income countries in terms of GDP, but it came out, I can't remember, it's something like 1.5% of GDP. Now that's a big number, but it's not a number that's going to solve all, all of the problems of, of, of domestic revenue mobilizing. So that's all I'm saying. We have to see these issues in context. And you know, compared to some of the revenue gains one can get from improving the efficiency of the VAT, there much, there's much more money at stake there. So I'm talking pure revenue terms there, of course, there's equity and so on. Let me put that aside. Um, Maybe. Uh, yeah. I'll leave it there then. Okay, I'll leave the other questions. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Nara, I think some of the questions were, were addressed to you. Do we have, you have to pick up? Yes, um, just a question from the colleague from Cameroon. I just, um, here, the, 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 I don't think that the issue is to uh, actually increase inequality by um, um, uh, taxing and focusing more on, on, on tax on wealth, for example. It's to simply um, make sure that we increase the progressivity of the tax system by uh, um, making sure that we apply the ability to pay principle. Right, and, uh, and, and as a way, again, to just, um, of course, in addition to, 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 to the expenditure side, but focusing on reducing inequality. So it's basically, I, I guess that's the heart of it, and for increasing the progressivity by, by, by focusing on the ability to pay. And the question on the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement right now, for, I, mean, I mean, that's not my area of expertise, I won't pretend it is, um, but um, they have, I mean, You've seen that there's been a faster, I mean, the, the pace of negotiation and agreement has been actually quite fast since the implementation. And I think that's something that we can commend African countries for achieving. Um, uh, for example, they're saying, and it's something that can really continue in, in addition to the, the product of origin rules, they also that uh, the fact that they promised, I mean, of course, it's been delayed by the, by the, by, by the COVID-19, that they will focus more on um, um, the, the, uh, on increasing rule on competition and intellectual property right, and that if and they say that by the end of this year, so imagine if they are able to do to achieve that. I guess because the, the, as you know, our heads of state have said we don't care. You need to start implementing now, and then you're going to continue improving as you go along. I think if we continue around the competition, uh, intellectual properties, and all that, uh, by the end, the, at least those two by the end of uh, 2020, as I mentioned. I think we can start uh, seeing some, uh, reaping some benefit out of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mauricio, you also had a question. So two quick uh, reactions on the point of uh, carbon taxation. Yes, we need to ensure that uh, the transition to a low carbon economy is a just and fair transition, which means that not, uh, not all are going to go at the same pace and not necessarily every country will gonna, is going to pay the same tax for, for carbon emissions. But yes, there is a space for a carbon tax even in developing economies, although it could be at a lower rate. And, but we need to start with reducing energy subsidies. That would be a good way to begin this conversation. But um, on the issue of uh, tobacco taxation, um, Tobacco taxation, it's, it's a low-hanging fruit because when we think about taxation, there are always many, many trade-offs. Trade-offs between equity and efficiency, so you want taxes that are more progressive that help you in terms of redistribution, but then comes the issue of what's the cost in terms of growth, what's the cost in terms of efficiency, and those issues come a lot when we talk about, for example, on wealth taxation. But begin with taxes where there are much lower trade-offs, where trade-offs are perhaps even non-existent. And tobacco taxation is a good example because, yes, you achieve uh, the goal, generate some revenues, but at the same time you reduce the consumption of a harmful product, and that's good also from the point of view of uh, health outcomes. And earmarking for health purposes, I think it's a very sound idea. I tell you the experience when I was finance minister in Colombia, we tripled tobacco taxation, earmark for the universal health uh, insurance, and that just worked very well. You reduce consumption, people that still consume tobacco were paying higher prices that generated more revenues, and those revenues were essentially useful for paying the, um, the universal health insurance. So, Think, of think in terms of trade-offs and go for those taxes where the, less, where the trade offs 
seem a bit less complex? I think um, a lot of things have already been said, but let me say uh, one thing about carbon. Let me pick up from Mauricio, where Mauricio left it on carbon taxation. It's subsidies. Carbon, when I talk about carbon taxes, it can also be subsidies to energy. And those are really massive also in uh, uh, emerging economy and uh, low income countries. And actually I want to give you a positive example of a country like Chad that relies on oil, as you know, primarily. They did introduce a tax on carbon. They didn't, they didn't introduce it for that purpose. They didn't introduce it to basically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But it's one of the major tax handles that they have in the country right now. And so indirectly or directly, they're also addressing the issue. So I think the point here is let's be smart about these things while we also recognize that there is a just transition. There is also an issue of, you know, the level now of oil is price oil, oil prices is very high, but the subsidies equivalently are very high by the same fact that the prices are high. So this is one thing. The other thing is that together with the IMF, we have developed a carbon pricing assessment tool. And that allows us also to assess with different assumptions of so country by country is an empirical application to assess the redistributive impact. If other taxes are, for example, phased out or reduced, I talked earlier about uh, labor taxation. Now, for some countries, taxation of labor doesn't matter a lot. I do recognize because tax is not taxed a lot. That we heard about informal economy, but there are other dimensions that are embedded in the tool that look at actually the redistributive impact. So, on taxation, just the last point because actually I think that I feel I'm one of those economies that is always allergic to your marking. Now, uh, so I need I need to say this. These are Pigouvian taxes, so it's true that taxing, um, a, taxing bads is good, but the idea is to address the behavior. And so over time, we have a sustainability issue because if the tax on bad is efficient and effective, ideally the base disappears. So if we earmark to particular spending, the risk is of the non-sustainability of the spending. Now. These are empirical questions, so I don't want to go, you know, I, I realize that we need to look at the elasticity of the base, et cetera. But I think, let me go back to the theory. I don't know if Mika is still there, but that's the reason why your marking is not ideal for Pigouvian taxes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, sadly, I'm being <laughs> told that we, are, we can't take more questions because we have to stop here, but I think we have a coffee break and then all the pending questions could be asked in that coffee break. Thank you for such a rich panel and discussions and questions. Thank you. Thank you.